Nothing on this channel should be taken as financial advice. I have no finance background. This video, this channel is sponsored by the XX Network. There is a certain enthusiasm in liberty that makes human nature rise above itself in acts of bravery and heroism. We've got a developing story to talk about the U.S. Treasury and uh, Commerce Department among the federal agencies that were victim of a massive cyber attack on the U.S. government was far more wide-reaching than previously thought. Unprecedented in audacity and scope. From a software engineering perspective, it's probably fair to say that this is the largest and most sophisticated attack the world has ever seen. On December 13th, 2020, a widespread cyber attack was carried out by a group believed to be sponsored by the Russian government. The attack used SolarWinds Orion software to infiltrate supply chains and affect thousands of organizations worldwide, including the U.S. government. In response to the attack, U.S. Senator Richard J. Durbin described it as an act of war. Well, um, there's there's no question that, that SolarWinds um, you know, led to the executive order, and it's also forcing uh, attention and priority to zero trust. But the, the nature of the attack in solar winds allowed adversaries to get inside uh, or to conduct reconnaissance and get inside many networks. And once, you know, past the perimeter and inside the network, the opportunity for lateral movement could be largely unrestricted. The recent SolarWinds attack was severe enough that an executive order on cybersecurity was enacted. The Zero Trust Security Model is designed to prevent future attacks of this nature by eliminating any implicit trust in any one element, node, or service. This requires continuous verification of the operational picture via real-time information from multiple sources, determine access and other system responses. Glenn Hutchins, head of Silver Lake, which was invested in private equity of SolarWinds, sold their equity in SolarWinds on the public market days before the attack. Metaverse. Uh, in the coming year or two, I'm going to predict for you, this is my one prediction, uh, that the new buzzwords will be DAOs, which are decentralized autonomous organizations, uh, and zero knowledge proofs. Glenn Hutchins, a former advisor to the Clintons on the board of the Obama Foundation and former Federal Reserves, he states on CNBC that the new buzzwords will be DAOs and zero-knowledge proofs. Zero-knowledge proofs are privacy chains that will reveal data under certain conditions. He is very involved in the crypto space and is a Ripple investor. The zero-trust security model requires continuous verification in real time. That is a use case that crypto networks would fit. When it comes to large corporations or governments, a layer of privacy is a must. Silver Lake sold their equity prior to the news becoming public that SolarWinds was hacked. Hutchins is a very connected guy and he understands where the trend is headed. Well, many Australians over the past few days, may well be you or someone you know, has received a letter or an email basically from their accountant saying, uh, oh, by the way, you've got to get a digital identity, a director's digital ID by next Wednesday, November 30th, or you could be fined a million dollars. As the financial system is upgraded, a digital identity requirement is going into effect. Australia has passed a law mandating that all corporations have a digital ID connected to a database of sensitive information. Those who do not comply will be fined one million dollars. In the hawk years, there was talk of an Australian ID card, a pass card, whatever it was called, the public revolted against it and said, no, 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 government shouldn't have this amount of information and control over us. This leaves that for dead. That's child's play compared to what is being proposed now or what is now law. Uh, you have to give all your passport details, your Medicare details, uh, your driver's licence, your home, your address, your phone. Everything gets onto one yep. ID number, one long number. Now, as we know, as I mentioned before, the two things that disturb me greatly about this is first, why are they insisting on a million dollar fine? I mean, that is terrifying. You don't fine people a million dollars for no reason at all. This is to scare the bejesus out of people to uh, make them sign up to this thing or to force them to. Directors of companies, as you say, can be anybody from a small business company to someone doing some local charity work who's, who's, who's now suddenly has to have everything of theirs on this global digital platform. This is globalism yep. out of control. Now, what really terrifies me, Andrea, and I, you know, the reality is... Digital IDs are required for compliance with anti-money laundering and know your customer regulations in banking. 
An ID needs to be attached to transactions to comply with existing laws. However, if we use a centralized non-private system for digital IDs, this will open the door to an oppressive system. If IDs were decentralized and private, users could determine whether to reveal necessary information. All the data would be there, but it would only be accessible if the user voluntarily provides it, or if there is a court order in place. The XX network is a protocol where this system could be built, preserving the rights of the people instead of a centralized system that, like SolarWinds, is susceptible to cyber attacks. XX network is state-of-the-art encryption decentralized and could adhere to the zero trust policy in the U.S. Personally, from an economic standpoint, all these rules do not work and add friction to an already broken system. One of the reasons the SolarWinds hack has been especially concerning is that it was not detected by the multi-billion dollar U.S. government cybersecurity enterprise. Forensic evidence suggests it was the work of a group known as Cozy Bear. Nothing cuddly about them, though. It's the code name for a branch of Russian intelligence with many, many digital claws. And we asked ourselves, how many engineers did we believe had worked on this collective effort? And the answer we came to was at least a 1,000. I should say at least a thousand very skilled, capable engineers. With the backing of the Kremlin, Cozy Bear is suspected to be behind a long list of exploits. The Democratic Campaign email service in 2016. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. Some Five Eyes intelligence partners also believe it tried to steal lucrative information on COVID-19 vaccine research. Now, to be a mistake to think America and its friends are victims here, they're actually cyber warriors themselves. And in this war, each bad turn deserves another. So they return fire daily, loitering, learning, and then trying to degrade their opponent's systems. New technologies are always accompanied by new challenges. The cyber world is no exception. With vast oceans of data, there are new opportunities for malicious actors. Some regulators might be alarmed by the idea of a privacy chain, but stomping on privacy innovation would be the worst outcome. Like Ripple has argued with crypto assets, stifling innovation puts the U.S. at a disadvantage. The same is true for privacy technology. Nation states are currently under cyber attack and decentralized protocols are a new technology that has proven itself over the last 10 years by not being hacked. They're trying to deter theft of intellectual property, like the cutting-edge designs of fighter jets, or to thwart bribery and extortion using stolen secrets, all to prove no one gets away with anything easily in this battle. My, my view is that that, that contest, that, that real-world application of cyber warfare or cybersecurity is already here. If anything, the threat is just getting more frequent, more sophisticated, more complex uh, across the whole industry and across uh, cyberspace. Decentralized privacy networks offer several advantages over traditional centralized platforms. They're unhackable. Users have custody of their intangibles, and they offer a level of privacy that is unparalleled. Even the most secure centralized platforms have failed, but decentralized privacy networks don't have a single point of failure. They're designed in a way that if a hacker broke into one node, they can't do anything. They would need to hack every node on the network to trick the network. That's impossible, especially when cryptographers like David Chum have created quantum-resistant encryption. The encryption standard is advancing and it won't come from the government. It'll come from the private sector. True innovation and leadership come from the free market, not a top-down approach. If the USA banned privacy technologies, there would be other countries that didn't, and they would have access to the best of the best. These cyber attacks are national security threats, and the free market is the best way to produce the best solutions. Everyone benefits from this approach. Is, you know, uh, that... I don't know how many of your listeners realize that coffee was criminalized both in, in England and also in the Middle East for, for the longest time by rulers who felt that if people got together in coffee houses, who knows what they would be talking about? It's Look it up. It's startling, you know, and this is a revolutionary uh, thought. Yeah, it's, just, it's really a, it's, it's quite a surprising. 
During Sweden's attempt to colonize various areas of the world, the Swedish government banned coffee in an attempt to prevent money from flowing to their enemies. Those who disobeyed the state by buying coffee were punished by having their names published in the local paper. However, Sweden ultimately fell due to the free market's demand for coffee. So, yeah, like 500 years, there's a very... So it's like, um, you know, uh, this is... I think it makes the point... You know, you need, uh, you know, there was this bookstore in San Francisco, I think it's defunct now, but it was called The Clean, Well-Lighted Place for Books. I always liked the name of it. If you need a protected sphere, a place where you can uh, be you, where you can have an actual uh, political uh, consciousness and development and, and discuss uh, issues and actually meaningfully participate in, in governance. Absent that, there's no... There's no uh, democracy, and, and it's not much to ask for. And, you know, if you try to criminalize that, claiming, you know, some kind of, you know, abuse of this or that, I mean, you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, you know? Yeah, sure, there might be some trade-offs, and I don't want to get into all this kind of, you know, guns don't kill people, it's the people, whatever. It's, but, no, you want democracy, that is a necessary condition. It's ironic that U.S. elected officials criticized China when Edward Snowden revealed that the NSA was surveilling everyone in the United States. If the U.S. bans privacy, it would put us at a disadvantage for the cyber war and eliminate the illusion of freedom. If there is a global war, it'll start with cyber, you know, if it's not already started. Do you, do you feel like there's a, like a boiling, like the, the drums of war are beating? What's happening in Ukraine with Russia, it feels like the United States is becoming more and more involved in the conflict in that part of the world, and China is watching very closely. It's starting to get involved geopolitically and probably in terms of cyber. Um, do you worry about this kind of thing happening in the next decade or two, like where it really escalates? You know, people in the, in the 1920s were completely terrible at predicting the World War II. Do you think we're at the precipice of war potentially? I think we could be. I, I mean, I, I would hate to just be, you know, just fear mongering out there, um, you know, and COVID's over. So the next big thing in the media is war and all that. But I mean, there, there's some some flags going up that are, that are very strange to me. Is there ways to avoid this? I hope so. I hope smarter people than I are figuring it out. I hope people are playing their parts and in, in, in talking to the right people, um, because that's it, the war is the last thing I want. Former FBI agent Christopher Tarbell is seeing some red flags raised on the cyber warfare front. Well, there's two things to be concerned about on the cyber side. One is the actual defense on the technical side of cyber, and the other one is the panic that what might happen when something like some dramatic event happened because of cyber, some major hack that becomes public. I'm honestly more concerned about the panic because I feel like if people don't think about this stuff, the panic can hit harder. Like if, if, they, if, if they're not conscious about the fact that we're constantly under attack, I feel like it'll come like a much harder surprise. Yeah, I think people will be really shocked on things. I mean, so we talked about LulzSec today, and LulzSec was 2011. They had access into a water, the water supply system of a major U.S. city. They didn't do anything with it. They were sitting on it in case someone got arrested, and they were going to maybe just expose that it's, that it's insecure. Maybe they were going to do something to fuck with it. I don't know. But, you know, that that's, that's 2011. You know, I don't think it's gotten a lot better since then. And there's probably nation states or major organizations that are sitting secretly on hacks like 100%, this. 100%. 100%. They are sitting secretly waiting to expose things. Cyber warfare is a real and present danger. The XX protocol offers a secure and safe network that will allow applications to be built on top of it. Crypto has been battle tested, trillions of dollars out in the open, yet nobody's broken into these protocols. The incentive is there, yet it hasn't happened. Hopefully, cyber war never becomes a reality, but the best offense is a good defense. Decentralized technologies are proving themselves while centralized systems are failing. I mean, I, I again, I don't want to scare the shit out of people, but people have to understand the cyber threat. I mean, there are, you know, 
there are the, the, there are thousands of nation state hackers in some countries. I mean, we have them too. We have offensive hackers. You know, the the terrorist attacks of nine eleven. There's planes that actually hit actual buildings, and it was visibly clear, and you can trace the information. With cyber attacks, say something that would result in the exp- in a major explosion in New York City. How the hell do you trace that? Like, if it's well done, it's going to be extremely difficult. the The problem is, it, 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 there's so many problems. One of which the U.S. government, in that case, has complete freedom to blame anybody they want. True. And then to to go start war with anybody, a, anybody that actually see uh, Jew. Uh, all right, that's sorry, that's one cynical take on it of course no but you're going down the right path i mean the guys that the flew planes in the buildings wanted attribution they took credit for it when we see the cyber attack i doubt we're going to see attribution maybe the victim side the u.s government on this side might come out and try to blame somebody but you know like you've brought up they, they could blame anybody they want there's not really a good way of verifying that There is a growing concern that the traditional financial economy is in a debt bubble that could pop at any moment. A cyber attack, while ambiguous, could be the trigger that sets off a chain reaction of events leading to the collapse of the current system. We have seen the trend of decentralization and the traditional system collapsing. We've seen the incumbent central banks and national infrastructure being tested and developed on DLT-based technologies. This entire system has evolved and historically debt to GDP levels are at record highs. Nations have collapsed from this amount of debt to GDP and we are at those levels. The loss of liberty to a generous mind is worse than death. Head over to hub.xx.network which provides links to all dApps, tools, quantum sleeve wallets, SDKs, and docs related to the XX network. If you're a developer, the XX Foundation offers grant opportunities to create dApps on the XX network. Speakeasy is the world's first truly anonymous social media communication apps for conversations, debate, and information sharing. Test the alpha version at alpha.speakeasy.tech.